I think Adam said what I was going to say, so I'll... There are uh, what people call tectonic changes going on. That's, that's undeniable. This is, to use Clay's term, going to be highly disruptive. There's, there's no question about that. From where I sit, there are several major tectonic plates that are moving uh, simultaneously and in different directions. Uh, technology is one of them. There's no doubt about that. But I think it's useful perhaps for me to take a minute or two and sketch the, the others. I mean, I see at least four major plates that are moving. One is what I will call a political plate. Uh, there is a change in the political environment that is dramatic. It portends a devaluation of thought. We tend to communicate in slogans. We don't extend our conversation. We don't engage the other party. And uh, we feel no obligation to go beyond the original declarative statement. That cannot be good for uh, society in general. It certainly can't be good for research universities. A second plate that is undergoing dramatic shifts, I'll call, for want of a better word, financial. If one looks out over the next decades, there's a huge public disinvestment in higher education occurring. This is causing pressures on uh, the traditional providers, but there's absolutely no question that if one looks out uh, 5, 10, 20 years in the long run, the public investment, and I'll now add public and private investment because there's going to be pressure on households uh, that's allocated to higher education is going to shrink as a percentage of the gross national product. Uh, we see this most dramatically in the radical withdrawal of subsidy from the cost subsidy price equation that leads inevitably to the, to the development of pressure upward on price, which we call tuition. It's a huge factor that's in the picture. A third major plate is what I will call globalization. But I don't mean globalization the way it's usually used in a business school. I'm not using it in George Soros's sense. I'm using it, frankly, more in the sense of the Jesuit theologian Teilhard de Jardin, who wrote 50 years before Soros ever used the word to describe economic transactions. It is a movement of human capital. Think the Italian Renaissance. Uh, human capital, brain power, talent will not be confined to a particular area. And I would say that will have profound effects on the structure of higher education. The Global Network University is one example of that. When I was the chair of the American Council on Education, we had as our keynote speaker, Clay, it was the first time that he and I had met personally. And I, I remember talking to him about the Global Network University as the kind of high-end disruptive m move. When the Yale Board of Trustees came here, and spent the day learning about it, they left saying this is the disruptive move that affects places like Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Yale. And there's a way to view the Global Network University as a disruptive technology. And then, of course, the fourth is technology itself. The, the QED from this, the therefore of this that uh, strikes me, is that the status quo is not an option. The status quo is not an option, that we're in for a radical uh, restructuring of higher education. Today, in the United States, there are about, round numbers, 5,000 colleges and universities from community colleges through. That's going to change. My sense is that uh, of those 5,000, quote, traditional providers, close quote, there will be only a fraction of them 10, 20 years from now. I think it might surprise some people for me to say that 30, 40 percent of the remaining traditional providers will be faith-based. They'll offer a value proposition that will be attractive to people who want a certain kind of education for their children and be willing to sacrifice for it. And the, traditional, the other traditional providers will be real value providers. That's what we hope to provide with the education that the Global Network University provides, you know, kind of move, move, move up. There'll be tremendous diversification. Now, the interesting thing is that every time I'm at a meeting of presidents of uh, American universities, there's great talk about the strength of American University being its diversity, and that is true. We are a, a, a symphony orchestra of traditional providers already, but there'll be a kind of hyper-diversification that will occur. There will be universities that will operate completely online. There's no question about that. What will happen, I think, worldwide is what the Europeans call the massification of higher education. I am terrified. I am utterly terrified as the political classes uh, around the world, particularly in 
the, the well-off countries of Europe and the United States press the agenda of massification, which is laudable at first blanche, is going to lead to a horrible social stratification. I have said to leaders that uh, press things like online universities as efforts to raise uh, the percentage of people with BA degrees, uh, you know, the horror that the United States, which 10 years ago was number one, is now number 14. Uh, now at 39 percent, we want to get to 60 percent by 2020 of the relevant population with BA degrees. My fear, having been in education for 50 years, is that the easiest way to get there is the equivalent uh, at the higher education level of social promotion. And, and it will not be the children of the plutocrats or the uh, oligarchs or the elites the connected, the informed, that will go to uh, Western Governors University. I've said to leaders that I will go to the bank and borrow $200,000 and put it in an attache case and offer it to the leaders, leaders of the American political scene who are advocating such things when they give me a piece of paper saying that they're going to send their children to Western Governors University. But, you know, we live in a city where the, the people that have all the choices kill to get into kindergartens that cost $35,000 a year. What do they know that we're not telling the poor, the unconnected, and the uninformed? So stratification is a great, great fear that I have. I think that we have to yearn for, and the future I hope for, is the importance of matching talent with the place in the orchestra, the diversified orchestra of higher education. That talent can thrive the best. And I think technology will be part of that at every level. It'll enhance every section of the org. Yes, I am the the chairman of the advisory board of the University of the People, which is completely online and gives kids in sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and Haiti uh, a, a chance when the alternative is nothing, providing a, 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 an education that is completely online but has touch and is in class and peer-to-peer -peer learning. But it will also enhance what goes on in this building and, and in the buildings around this campus. And if we use it correctly, technology will become, as the University of the People has become for NYU, a talent identifier. So you pick up the kids and move them up the ladder of touch to where they can get to the education that the, the well-connected and well-informed and well-resourced yearn for for their own. One final point as, as I close, there, there, there's an interesting difference, it seems to me, between the kind of disruptive technology that Clay describes so eloquently in his work, steel industry, for example, and what's going on here, because it's, it is higher, it's people in the room here, it's higher education itself, which is creating a lot of the disruption here, from the Global Network University to the technology. Uh, a lot of the key actors are very much the progenitors of the change that's coming. On the other hand, the core of the enterprise, core of the enterprise, the, the median faculty member is working on the assumption that things are going to be the same 10 years from now as they were, you know, 20 years ago. And, and people like presidents are sent off to, to view what's outside the cave, and you come back in the cave with the message, and uh, it, it, it's seen as heretical. And then the other part of the picture, just so you get the final thing, is you have these, uh, these people called board members. And they, they operate in command and control environments, some of them command and control environments where the disruptive technologies that they see as relevant to us are highly available and important. And, and, and they think they see clearly the answer. They see us, even the presidents or deans who've come from outside the cave back into the cave and are trying to explain to the people in the cave there is sun out there. They see us as the equivalent of the horseshoer as the Model T is being invented. And why haven't we done this next week? And why don't you just tell these people that this is what they have to do? And there's a, there's a kind of strange trichotomy between the creators uh, who see it all, who are amongst those who prefer to look at the fire on the wall of the cave and don't want to be disturbed, and these other people who, who don't really understand the soul of the academic enterprise, who think that they have all the answers. So when you figure that all out by the end of the day, <laughs> it's, it's just uh, slip me a note. And <laughs> thank you very, very much for having me here.